but thank you for joining us. Homestead, great, all over town, love it. The roads, Betsy, welcome. Great. All right, well, we know Miami and we know people will be continuing to file in, so we're thankful for that. But we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna do our best to um, respect your time tonight and try to keep it right around an hour or less. But um, just so thankful that you've joined us tonight. Um, if this is your first webinar, welcome. And if you've joined us before, welcome. And, and you're obviously back because you know what a great series this has been. We have learned so much and been so encouraged. So if you've missed any of the previous ones, we've talked about burn safety, we've talked about COVID and summer camp, all kinds of great topics that I know are super relevant for family life and life in Miami right now. So if you missed any of those, you can go to jacksonevents.org and catch up and watch all the recordings. So feel free to do that anytime. But my name is Sierra Bragan and I am the owner and founder of Miami Mom Collective, formerly Miami Moms Blog. We just rebranded this week. But we have been in partnership with um, Jackson Health Children's Care. And like I said, this series has just been phenomenal. Eye-opening, enlightening for me personally. I know for those who've been joining in. So tonight we are excited to talk about the subject of ER versus urgent care. And I'll admit, I was kind of thinking, you know what, that's something you kind of just wing it or you just figure it out or your gut kind of tells you but um we're excited because tonight dr e robert schwartz is going to be sharing with us more specifics of how and when to make that decision between er and urgent care so i'd like to take a minute and introduce um, dr schwartz he's a professor and chair of the department of family medicine and community health at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Now, his bio will blow you away and you will walk away going, this man knows a lot about family practice and family medicine. So he's a fellow of the American Academy of Family Practice as well as a board member of the Family Academy of, I'm sorry, the Florida Academy of Family Practice. So he was elected chair of the academic programs for the Florida Academy of Family Practice, and he completed his training and his academic fellowship in New York at the State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island. So he later, after that, served as the director of the Family Practice Residency Program. So a wealth of experience to share with us tonight about families, about you know how to decide when and where to take your family or yourself when you have an emergency. Um, in 1998, he was actually recruited by the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine to become the second chair of the family medicine department and home of the first ever, I didn't realize this, but the University of Miami is the first ever family practice residency training program. So a lot of great things happening there. And Dr. Schwartz, of course, is overseeing all that. For four years, he served as the president of the Memorial, the Jackson Memorial Hospital medical staff. So uh, along with that, he's very busy, but he's joined us tonight. And um, he comes with not only experience, but I believe a heart for our city. Um, in 2003, Dr. Schwartz received the Healthcare Heroes Award from the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce because of the leadership that he had in establishing the Jefferson Reeves Senior Health Center in, in um, Overtown in Miami. So just amazing work that's going on there. And that practice is actually still um, going today. So the center serves as a teaching environment for medical students and allied healthcare professionals, as well as delivering care to the community and underserved population. Um, but that's not it. <laughs> he has continued, he has done so much. In 2012, he was presented with the Jesse Trice Hero Award at the annual Health Choice Network luncheon for his work in serving the community and his chairmanship of the South Florida Regional Extension Center. He's involved in a number, as you can imagine, community organizations such as the South Florida Health Information Exchange and also chairing the Miami-Dade Health Action Network. Goodness, I don't know how you have time to sleep or do anything else. <laughs> We're so glad that you're with us today. Thank you, Sierra. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> Um, don't Amazing. Forget, I have, I have don't, to don't say forget that me. that happened over over many years. Didn't happen That's just right. in. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me. I know those accolades are all very important to you, but I think tell me that father and grandfather are two of your favorite titles. Is that right? Absolutely. I have very close to my sons, 
and of course, um, uh, very close to my grandchildren. I love that. I love that. Dr. Schwartz was telling me before that he's got granddaughters and one grandson. So I love that. And, and as moms, as families, we know that to find a healthcare professional who has a family mindset is hugely important because it just, we instantly feel that safety, security, that connection to say, okay, he's going to understand what it feels like to be a mom or a dad making a decision for my child or my family. So we're thankful for that. Wonderful. Well, let's get started. Let's talk about urgent care versus ER. Let's start with urgent care. Tell me, are the urgent care centers, are they open 24 hours like an emergency room? No, unfortunately, they're not. They're, they're open. Hospital is 24 hour and it's a kids only emergency room, right? So you're not taking your kids where there's adults as well, correct? That's correct. I, I think it's important, oh, you know, okay. during this uh, period of okay. pandemic, uh, just to say something about the safety at the urgent care centers. I think many people right now are afraid to go to an emergency room. They're also afraid to go to an urgent care center. And I, I just want to reassure everybody that's listening that um, we at the urgent care centers take the, everyone's safety um, and, and uh, it's the, our highest priority. So when you come in, uh, we make sure that you have a mask um, we make sure that um, uh, you, if you'd like to wear gloves, you can. There are places to um, uh, wash your hands. We make sure that people are not congregating in the waiting room so that we ask people to actually right now, of course, during the pandemic, to wait in their car and then they come in uh, one by one. Um, the exam rooms are, are cleaned after each um, visit and um, the staff all wears um, uh, protective equipment, PPE, I'm sure everybody's heard that term now, um, uh, when appropriate, when they're uh, seeing patients. That's great, that's good to know. And that's one thing that we're all extra conscious about right now is, okay, maybe I'm feeling sick, but is it even safe or worth it to, to go checked out for what I might expose myself to? But great to know that all those precautions are being taken. Um, ladies and gentlemen who are watching, I do want to say if at any time you have a question tonight, there's a Q&A box down there on your bottom panel. And if you just click that, you can drop a question in and we'll see it. Um, we prefer if you put the questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all of those. So um, Dr. Schwartz, let's say, which funny enough, because I actually am experiencing some cold symptoms, no fever, thank you, Lord, we'll see. But when do I know if I should treat myself at home with over-the-counter medicines, or when should I maybe go see an urgent care or ER? So you, I'll go back to your, your first um, question in terms of, of why people uh, should go to urgent care. And so okay. let me say that, that all of our urgent cares are staffed by board-certified family doctors. And it's important for people to understand that family medicine training um, is, is a very broad training. Uh, we see women, women's health. Uh, we, the residents learn how to deliver babies. Um, we take care of children. Uh, we take care of adolescents, uh, adults, um, uh, and um, uh, older people <laughs> like myself. Um, so it's a very broad training. Um, and, and I think that's important for people to understand um, we live in a, a very specialized environment where most people are used to seeing a cardiologist or a, um, a ear, nose, and throat doctor, et cetera. But for the most part, um, the kinds of things that we see in urgent care, and I, I'm going to uh, also focus on, on what uh, the most common things that children have, um, strep throat, for example, number one uh, reason to, to visit um, urgent care. Um, uh, okay urinary tract infections, asthma, right. um, sunburn, uh, rashes, um, uh, conjunctivitis, a uh, common cold, uh, all of these things are, are uh, uh, if you're sick and you can't get a hold of your primary care doctor, you don't, if you don't have one, um, then all of those things are easily treated um, in an urgent care environment. Okay, that's great. Now, that's now great. the difference, for example, uh, with emergency rooms, um, it's usually uh, things like um, very high fever. So you have a child at home and they have a very high fever and you've tried everything, you've given them some Tylenol or ibuprofen, you put them in the bathtub and trying to bathe them 
and uh, uh, you can't get their fever down. Uh, that certainly can be seen in urgent care, but if the child has a history of uh, some type of chronic illness, uh, if, they, if they're diabetic or they have um, uh, severe asthma, et cetera, and they're short of breath and can't breathe, then those would be times that it might be better to go to the emergency room. However, things like uh, a cut, a laceration, something that needs stitches, if it's simple, certainly can be done in urgent care. Um, oh, you can do stitches at urgent care? Because I would have thought, if I need stitches, straight to the ER, but I can go no, to urgent care no, for that. No, absolutely. That the family doctors are trained in doing uh, minor suturing and repairs, um, even setting bones. Every one of the urgent care sites has a radiology um, suite, oh, and uh, okay. the physician can read the report. And because we're such a large institution, we have uh, our uh, Department of Radiology um, backing up and looking at the x-rays, and uh, you're getting a second pair of eyes on the, on the, the read of the, of the x-ray. So if you have wow. a, a fracture, et cetera, then of course uh, you can be seen and the bone can be set. If you need a referral, then the uh, University and Jackson Health System have specialists of every type um, that right. uh, you would get a direct referral to from the urgent care program. Well, that's great. Dr. Schwartz, I have to admit that I kind of have had the assumption that, you know, you said all of the, the board certified physicians that are at urgent care. I'll admit, I kind of thought urgent care is, you know, where you go if it's just something small and you need to see not you know, maybe not like a full board, board certified doctor, but maybe a PA or something like that. But that's news to me and great news that you're seeing, you know, board certified physicians and you can do things like x-rays. And did you say cast, like uh, cast broken bones as well? Absolutely. Yeah. If it's, wow. if it's a, um, a simple fracture, then it can be cast um, and supported. Many times um, when it's a severe fracture, it can also be splinted and not every fracture needs to be set immediately. Sometimes they just okay. need to be splinted and then they'll see an orthopedist uh, when, when it's something more severe where they would do it under anesthesia, where they would fix the, and straighten the bone um, uh, under anesthesia. Now, of course, okay. if, you were in an, if you were in an accident, car accident, and you, you had a fracture and a bone was sticking out of your skin, that, that's obviously right. not an urgent care visit that you would want to go to the emergency room. Emergency room, yeah. Okay, great. Let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 since that's just such a reality right now for our community. Here I am experiencing cold-like symptoms. If I start to feel worse or I think, oh, like at what point should I be concerned that I could have coronavirus and should I go, can I be tested at an urgent care? Should I go to the ER? Well, I would say right now going to the ER is uh, not such an easy task. Um, right. the ERs um, are, are to some degree overwhelmed at the moment with okay. patients going. But if, if you have a common cold, if you have the sniffles, um, if you have an earache, um, if you have a mild fever, you certainly could go uh, to urgent care. And if the physician determines that you're likely that you have uh, COVID-19, then they might send you to the emergency room if your condition warrants. Now, okay. it's, it's interesting um, uh, over the last couple of weeks, even though more people are testing um, uh, COVID-19 positive, people haven't been getting quite as sick um, okay. as they have That's in the beginning. The, the majority of people that are very ill and that um, have passed away in the hospital are those people who have underlying conditions, uh, heart right. disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, very severe asthma, metabolic syndrome where they're very overweight, um, those people are more susceptible uh, to being severely ill. The common symptoms now, which originally started out as just being dry cough, fever, um, uh, malaise, which is right. just kind of uh, fatigue, um, right. the people now are experiencing more flu-like symptoms, uh, okay. which, uh, which are muscle aches and pains, some diarrhea, some headache, things like that, and, and fatigue. So um, we're not sure exactly why that is. Um, you know, okay, uh, that's many, interesting. Many people are, are infected, but not necessarily as sick as the people that are admitted to hospital. Okay, great. 
do they do, um, I'm sorry if I missed this, do they do COVID-19 testing at an urgent care center? They do, right? So right, yeah, right now the urgent cares are doing serology testing. So okay. there are two types of testing. One is called a PCR, which okay. is a rapid test. I'm sure everybody's seen on the television where they pass a, a small uh, Q-tip into the nose, into the back of right. the nose. And that's a, a rapid test and that tells you if you have the infection at the moment, um, you know, if you've been sick for three, four, five days, then the rapid test is being done uh, out in the community. It's not currently being done at urgent care, um, okay. but we are doing the serology test. And the serology test demonstrates that somebody who has had it has started to develop antibodies, which is your, your body's immune system reacting to the virus and actually okay. protecting you from further infection. Okay, interesting, interesting. I, and I have a, a, a side note question that may be a little off subject, but I think you are qualified to answer for me. Um, with that, that antibody testing, is it true or false you can have the coronavirus and then not have it again? Or can you have it again? So it's a good question. Um, there are people who have um, gotten the virus and have tested positive and then eventually tested negative. And some of them, uh, weeks um, later, have tested positive again without symptoms. And some people have lingering symptoms, sometimes for weeks and weeks. So the fatigue and the um, muscle aches and pains, et cetera, can last for a period of time. So yeah. vi viruses are, are strange kinds of, of infections. They get inside of your cells, and uh, they can stay there for a while and, and cause dysfunction, um, problems like uh, fatigue and, and uh, body aches and pains or, or uh, diarrhea. So it's a good question. It, it's very variable from, from person to person. Okay, okay. Along those lines, now that, that the antibody test is wildly, uh, like widely available, should we get tested? Do you, I'm like, are there any benefits to getting it or is there no need if you don't have symptoms, I guess? Well, to be honest, the, the, the most important um, reason, I think, to test uh, and get the serology test is if you're positive and you've developed antibodies, you then, if you are willing, you can become a donor of your serum. So okay. the, the blood um, that you give can be um, uh, skimmed off and the serum pulled out, and that serum contains your antibodies and can be donated through um, uh, uh, the organizations in the city and the Red Cross uh, back okay. to the hospitals to treat people who are very sick. And it's been shown that those antibodies in another person's serum um, can help that person fight the infection. Interesting. So is that like when we hear, you know, I've been seeing on social media about people needing plasma donors. Is that what you were speaking that's, about? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Interesting. Great. Well, th but that's plasma of patients who've tested positive. Positive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not, not just Who've any plasma donor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> People who have recovered. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, Richard I asked a question, um, and I'd love it if you clarify a little bit more, Richard, so we can answer it, you know, precisely. Um, he's talking to about urgent cares across the board, but maybe my question is, um, can you speak to like how many urgent cares, you know, facilities are there in the area? you know, under this brand that, that families could visit, or is there a certain one you would direct people to? Well, we, we have five urgent care programs, and at the end of this seminar, we will put up uh, the addresses and the phone numbers and the locations Wonderful. of the five centers. There are obviously other um, urgent care programs in the city, uh, Baptist, uh, MD Now, et cetera. I, I would say that the one of the, the major differences that we're offering is that um, we're, a, we're a, an organization that has a lot of, of, of strength to it. You have the Jackson Health System, the University of Miami, all of our specialists, uh, uh, and it's an integrated healthcare system. So the electronic medical record, uh, if somebody needs to, is seen in urgent care and then needs to be transferred to the uh, emergency room at Jackson, uh, all of those records are there. All the okay. staff that work in the urgent care are Jackson employees, um, and all of the physicians are um, University of Miami um, physicians. So it's a it's a real cooperative uh, relationship between the two. 
what I believe are the two strongest institutions uh, in, the, in the community. In addition, our family medicine residents in training also rotate um, at the urgent cares. And so very often um, they'll, they'll be an attending physician and, and a resident uh, who's there to uh, see uh, patients as well. Oh, that's great. So when parents and, and children are, you know, visiting, say, the Holtz Children's Hospital, they're also getting access to every sort of pediatric subspecialist because of that relationship with the University of Miami Health System, correct? That's correct. That's great. That's great. Yeah, that's definitely something you don't you don't see necessarily with other organizations. And I'll admit something I didn't realize. I kind of thought the two were very separate. And when we started this series, I thought, wow, it's very you know, multi-connected and then knowing that being connected to the university, there's always new things and there's advancements that, that you're getting access to when you're using this health system. So that's, that's great. That's correct. Wonderful. Um, tell me a little bit, I know you mentioned that urinary tract infections can be something that can be seen at um, urgent care. What about kidney stones? Is that something that you can see at, at a... Sure. So, so people, it's interesting, people, adults usually that have kidney stones are usually in significant pain and uh, they often wind up in the emergency room. But uh, nowadays they can actually come to urgent care. Uh, the treatment, the initial treatment is, is pain medication and IV hydration. And those things can be done in urgent care. And we're just about to um, uh, get ultrasound machines um, oh, wow. uh, at each of one of the sites. And uh, this is new modern equipment. And with an ultrasound, you can actually um, help diagnose a kidney stone and find out where it is, whether it's in the kidney, whether it's in the ureter, which is the tract from the kidney to the bladder, whether it's in the bladder, um, and to some degree, the size of the stone. So it's, uh, it's equipment that can be very useful in making a, an accurate diagnosis. Oh, that's great. And I know you mentioned ultrasound in terms of kidney stones. I'm a pregnant mama. So would tell me about if, if someone who maybe were expecting had an emergency and maybe their OB doctor's office was closed because you guys are open on holidays, is urgent care a place that they could go or should they go to the ER? Well, I mean, again, it depends. Um, if, if they were worried, if the baby wasn't moving uh, like it usually does, they could go to an urgent care the ultrasound machine obviously can detect fetal heart rate. Um, and uh, again, family doctors are trained in uh, obstetrics and gynecology, so they can make a determination whether or not there's something more serious where you should go to Jackson, to the uh, obstetrics and labor floor, uh, right. or whether it's something minor and uh, can be handled um, in, the, in the urgent care setting. That's great. It's good to remember that the urgent care, you know, other than the things that you mentioned, of course, if you're having, you know, a heart issue or a bone sticking out, but that it's really kind of a catch-all for, ah, I don't know what's going on. Why don't I, I check out urgent care first? It's, it's a great right. option. Well, I think it's, it's important to, to know that the majority of medical problems are usually relatively straightforward and minor. Um, fortunately, people uh, don't, uh, every, every third person doesn't have a chest pain Right. and uh, is, a, is a cardiac patient and needs to go uh, to an emergency room where they can take care of that patient. So the majority of problems are, are very common, like urinary tract infections, like common colds, like uh, conjunctivitis, like uh, earaches. Um, the, the very typical childhood illness is otitis media, which is the medical term for uh, uh, inflammation of the tympanic membrane. Uh, those are oh. very common problems and easily seen okay. in urgent care. Okay, interesting. Great. Um, Jessica, in the questions, noted that if you donate blood, they'll test your antibodies for free, and then you could go back to donate plasma. So that's great to know. Thanks, Jessica, for sharing that. Um, let's see. Okay, Raquel is asking, what are the cases in which it might be okay to choose a telehealth option versus an urgent care? So right now we're not offering telehealth in the urgent okay. care offices, but many primary care physicians are using telehealth because of the pandemic. And um, again, uh, it, you have to remember that if there's something that needs to be examined physically, um, telehealth doesn't work very well. Right. Um, I actually, uh, in my clinical practice, I'm doing about half telehealth with patients and okay. half on-site uh, patient care. And the patients really enjoy telehealth, but 
you can't listen to somebody's lungs at the moment and uh, right. you can't take their vital signs. And um, uh, if somebody has a, um, a pain in their foot or their knee uh, or a joint, you can't examine them. Um, right. So I, there, there are those limitations about telemedicine that, yeah, make, uh, that make you know, on-site evaluation uh, very important. The physical exam is still an important part of making a diagnosis. That's right. Oh, I, I, I'll be interested to see the day when we're able to take our pulse, you know, via Zoom. I don't know if I'm, if I'm ready for that. <laughs> well, the, there are um, organizations and there are companies that are working on it and wow. the, the ability to do home blood pressure monitoring and heart rate and wow. oxygen level, all of that's coming. So it's, wow. not, it's only a few years away before it's a, a routine practice. Wow. I love the convenience of a telehealth option, but I am old school, you could say, I guess, in that I want to see my doctor face to face and I want to, you know, I want that connection. So um, it's great that urgent care offers that as well as the ER. Okay, here's one thing. When I'm feeling the need per se, I had a kidney stone years ago and, oh, it was awful. You don't wish it on your enemy. Um, and I've had two babies since, and I think I would choose the labor over the kidney stone. But anyways, um, you know, and I remember making that decision, like it was late at night. So I knew I had to go to the ER because an urgent care center was closed. So good to know, hopefully will never happen again, but in the future, I'll go to an urgent care center. Talk to me about wait times, because honestly, sometimes it's like, I don't even want to think about the ER because in my mind, that's hours of waiting. And then I'm like, but urgent care, is that also going to be hours of waiting? I don't know. Like how, what are like the wait times at Jackson Urgent Cares and ERs? That's a good question. And, and usually the wait times are very short. Um, my recommendation to people in the community is we're going to give you the phone numbers of the urgent cares nearest your, your home. And it's always a good idea to call before and, and ask that question. Um, are there many people waiting? Um, if, is there no one there? Can I just walk in? And of course, urgent care, you can just walk in. And usually um, we have multiple exam rooms. And even though there might be two or three patients being seen at one time, uh, wait times are usually very short. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, and I love, we're going to give you guys those numbers at the end so you know which one is closest to your home. But I've never thought to yeah, call ahead and see what, it, what am I getting into. So that's great advice. Um, tell me, do urgent care centers provide vaccines for children? Unfortunately, we don't, not, as, okay. not at this time. Uh, there may come a time in the future where right. we do uh, vaccinations, but that's still done either through the health department or with their private physicians. Okay. What about the same with flu vaccine, with flu season approaching, same thing? No, flu season, we will have uh, flu vaccine available. Okay. Great, great. And that's for children and adults, correct? That's correct. Awesome, awesome. Okay, what and, about and our... Oh, sorry. No, no, I was going to say, hopefully, as soon as we have the COVID-19 vaccine, we will also have that available, too. All right. Great. Great. Um, do urgent care centers provide, you know, physicals for back to school or sports involvement? You know, school's coming and we don't know what it's going to look like, but a physical is going to be part of that, whatever happens. So is that something we can do at urgent care centers? Absolutely. So family doctors are uh, very equipped to do uh, sports physicals and back to school physicals. The, it's part of the, their training. That's great. So that's an easy thing to get in for, to come and get Absolutely. taken care of. Wonderful. All right. Well, we're in the middle of summer. And so some children I know are in summer camp. If not, it's South Florida and people are spending time outside in the sun which means sunburn. So in our one of our previous um, webinars, we talked about sun safety, burn safety, all of that. But at what point is a burn bad enough to visit either the ER or urgent care? Well, I mean, usually if, if somebody has uh, more than 25% uh, of their body um, sunburn and they become dehydrated, uh, sometimes they need um, uh, intravenous hydration you can right. still be seen in urgent care. And okay. if, they're, if, they, if they're so burned that they're blistering, uh, that sometimes uh, actually needs a hospitalization. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, my attitude is the best uh, advice is not to get burned. Um, right, and, and <laughs> prevention. Prevention. Right. And, uh, and to not be out during the hottest time of day. And uh, of course, wear um, uh, sun protection 
Um, many people have the idea that if you just you know lather on uh, sunscreen, you're going to be protected, and unfortunately, that that's actually not true. Uh, mm. So the between ten and two, ten and three, in the hottest part of the day, you can still get quite burned, even if you're if you're wearing clothes. So yeah. it's very important to uh, to to stay out of the midday sun um, and try not to get burned. The other thing that that many people don't realize, especially with children, is that um, chronic uh, sunburn uh, uh, can lead to uh, adult skin cancer. And so mm. it's it's very yeah. important to to take the whole issue of sunburn into account and try and, and not get burned, uh, uh, certainly repetitively. Right. Wow. Yeah, to be thinking long term with our children and ourselves right. as well. It's just it's we can never be too careful, especially South Florida, it's something that we're exposed to every day. One of the blessings of Miami, but also, you know, a reminder to, to lather up and cover up and stay inside and those hottest parts of the day. That's right. Um, what about, I know, are there some of the Jackson Urgent Care Centers that are specifically for children or what age can children begin coming to an urgent care center? We, we usually say that, that you can bring a child um, uh, for, uh, two months and beyond. Okay, uh, and it, Very young. it's not it's not that you couldn't bring a newborn uh, to urgent care. Certainly, um, if they had a laceration or or some minor problem, but uh, our concern is uh, children under two months of age often need to be seen in the pediatric ER. So right. if they have, especially if they have a fever, um, they need a special kind of evaluation. Uh, otherwise, um, children um, of all ages can be can be seen. And the other thing I would mention is that um, we've all taken um, courses um, and certification um, for autistic um, uh, oh, awesome. children and families. I think that's an important thing. Um, uh, Tell me many more about that. many um, families um, have uh, autistic children or, mm -hmm. or autistic adolescents. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, for those parents who have autistic children, they know that the uh, uh, an emergency room or the doctor's office can be a very frightening uh, place for them. And, and unfortunately, many physicians don't necessarily know how to treat um, autistic children. And so uh, our courses have been very detailed. Uh, we have a um, special um, environment within the urgent care a, a section oh, wow. for, for children awesome. to play in, um, uh, certain types of, uh, of toys for them to play in. And the staff has all been uh, trained on on how to deal with um, with autistic and and the autistic spectrum um, uh, 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 disorder. That's amazing! Wow, to have that specialized training is definitely something that sets you apart. You spoke a little bit to this earlier, but maybe just elaborate that on that again. But what specifically sets you know these Jackson Urgent Care Centers? apart from the others and know the, the piece of being connected to the university and the other health systems, of course, um, but anything else that you would want our families to know when selecting an urgent care center? Well, I, I think the, just the relationship with the University of Miami and the Jackson Health System, um, the fact that our physicians are board certified, our staff mm -hmm. is highly trained, the fact that we have uh, enormous resources within the urgent care and um, the ability to uh, interact with the resources at Jackson uh, and the university when, when appropriate. Uh, we have radiology, we will, we're about to have ultrasound um, and um, having board certified physicians who have a broad um, skill set, um, I think makes our urgent care centers um, uh, a place to go when, when, you, need, when you need it. Definitely, definitely. Um, and those of you who are listening, again, if you have any specific questions for Dr. Schwartz, you can drop those in the Q&A and we'll um, address those. But um, you're speaking about the certifications and specialties. Um, I read that at Holtz Children's, that doctors and nurses are certified in pediatric advanced life support. Can you tell, explain, you know, we kind of, as you know, the layman hear these terms and we're like, wow, great certification. But can you elaborate more on what exactly does that mean? A pediatric advanced life support certification? It's, um, it's training that, that all of our doctors have to go through that if a child um, is not breathing, if a child would swallow something and be choking, if a child would have uh, um, 
a cardiac problem and um, was not responding. If a child um, uh, fell into a pool um, oh. and was semi-drowned, um, uh, advanced right. life support is training to help resuscitate a okay. child by um, appropriate breathing techniques, uh, cardiac resuscitation, um, uh, and management of um, that type of acute uh, problem that a child uh, might experience. Wow. Yeah, definitely something you want your physicians and nurses to have if you have to, heaven forbid, be in that situation. Oh, so scary, just especially, you know, living life on the water. Um, and in the summer months, it's just, it's imperative that we be extra diligent with our children, of course, around the water. Um, as families, we know that, we realize that, but it just can happen in a second. Um, it's scary for sure. Dr. Schwartz, um, we're so grateful for your time. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any other questions, drop them here. Otherwise, we're going to be rounding it up here in a minute. But I would love to hear just some more, uh, maybe personally from you, just your experience in overseeing you know, these students and these, I say students, but residents coming in and just the whole family practice experience that you have. Um, it's fascinating and to know that you've got just many years of background in this um, and how that has played a role in just your impacting families in your role as um, a physician. Well, I, being in academics has been a, a very rewarding uh, profession. Um, obviously, I, I have always maintained a clinical practice, um, but um, uh, being around medical students and uh, teaching them um, and teaching our residents who are uh, obviously in their postgraduate program um, has been a, a, a great uh, profession along with, along with being a physician. So being a teacher, um, one learns just as much from uh, your students as, uh, as you do from your patients. And um, most people don't realize that, uh, that family medicine is actually a specialty, just like uh, people who train in neurology or cardiology or endocrinology, any of the ologies, family medicine training is very broad. Um, they they, they uh, rotate through all of the different specialties over three years. Um, and they wow. have to take uh, board exams and they have specific requirements. They have to see so many patients um, during their rotation. And uh, we have faculty that oversee and teach them. And uh, when they finish their three years, they're uh, actually very qualified to go out and, and take care of the majority of healthcare problems that, uh, that people have. The other thing that's important is that family medicine also incorporates in their uh, education behavioral medicine. So okay. uh, many people's problems are uh, anxiety, depression, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, things that we think only are treated by psychiatrists. Right. But it's interesting, many, many patients don't actually want to go to psychiatrists. And sometimes insurance doesn't cover okay. psychiatric care. So right. family doctors are, are well-trained and equipped to, to also take care of um, uh, patients with behavioral uh, health problems. Oh, we, our training is called biopsychosocial training. Wow, the whole comprehensive everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the other important thing is... is uh, they're trained in, in nutrition, they're trained in prevention, and um, I, I, my whole career has been about getting people to eat properly, to exercise um, uh, as much as they can, um, right. and to try and lead uh, healthy lives and, and avoid getting sick um, uh, at all. That's right. Oh, that's so good to hear a doctor say that, because sometimes it's like, well, they're just out there to treat everything that's wrong, but like, no, you're there to help us make good decisions and preventative measures so that we don't need an ER or an urgent care necessarily or a specialist because we, we've done right. that. If, if we did a good job, then we would put ourselves out of business. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I think we're glad that you're in business. I actually have a, um, an attendee who's asked, do you have a family practice and are you accepting new adult patients? <laughs> I always get asked that. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I have a practice at the university and, um, you can go onto the university website and uh, if you want, you can make an appointment. 
Awesome. Awesome. Put that little plug in there. Great question. Um, another question, and you can plead the fifth on this one if you don't want to get into it, but um, someone is asking, they would love to know just maybe even a general point of view of a doctor about schools opening in Miami. And we know it's not the core of the webinar, but if you have a point of view to share, um, and if you want to plead the fifth, we can plead the fifth on that one, but I, I'm going no, to put it out there for you. No, I, I, I never plead the fifth. I, <laughs> I always um, have an opinion, and, and it's a very difficult um, decision. Um, yeah. and, and I'll just kind of lay out, you, you may have heard it on the news, in the sense that um, we realize now that, that many people, including children, are carriers uh, of the virus, and they may be completely asymptomatic, which means right. that they don't have fever and they don't have any of the typical symptoms. And so if you, if you open up the schools too soon, um, right. it's very possible that um, uh, your child will become infected and bring that infection home. There may be grandparents at home. There may be people with chronic illnesses. Um, right. And of course, the teachers are potentially right. uh, at risk. Yeah. So on, at the current moment, because of the fact that the pandemic is increasing, um, right. I think delaying school opening um, is probably um, a wiser choice at right. this point. Um, I know everybody is concerned and, and parents have been stuck right. at home with kids uh, trying to do self-education, but I think right. we have to take the, the long-term approach and realize that the social isolation piece, along with mask wearing and hand washing, is really a critical issue in terms of... of to some degree stopping the, the, the spread of the infection. So that, that's my take on it. Um, I know not everybody agrees with that. And I think politically it's become a hot potato right. Um, uh, right. nationally, but I think there are some real good reasons why delaying school opening is, is probably a good choice at this particular moment in time. Right, right. Dr. Schwartz, thank you for just offering, you know, your candid and honest opinion in that. Cause um, yeah, that's the hard thing. It's like, oh, I just kind of want to hear from a medical professional or what, and, and there's of course different opinions even in your field, but um, but we appreciate you you tackling that tonight. Thank you. Um, one mom is asking, and she did miss a little bit of the beginning, but potential broken bones, if they're not out of the skin, that can be dealt with at urgent care, correct? That's correct. Um, again, it, it all depends. So sometimes hand injuries, fractures of, of, a, of a finger, sometimes can, if they're non-displaced, that's the medical term, when the, when the okay. bones are, are not out of alignment, okay. certainly can be splinted and, and even casted. When the bones are misaligned and have to be put back into place, um, uh, uh, when somebody is, put, um, is given anesthesia and put to sleep because it can be very painful, Right. So a uh, splint is put on that uh, broken bone, and then they can uh, you know, take time, a day or so, uh, to get to an orthopedist or, or to an emergency room and have more definitive uh, care. That's great. Okay, good. Thank you for addressing that again. Um, Dr. Schwartz, I'm just curious personally, um, you know, reading about that Healthcare Hero Award that you received for your work in Overtown and just the underserved population there and amazing that that work is continuing. What would you say, and maybe it's that project or something else, but what has been maybe the most personally or professionally rewarding, you know, achievement of your career to date? Well, um, opening up of the clinic in Overtown certainly has been rewarding. Um, most people know that, that the Overtown community has been an underserved community. Um, it's a minority community. Um, many uh, black and brown uh, individuals live in the community and we know, uh, of course, that, that they don't always get the best care. And so right. opening up Jefferson Reeves and providing really high quality care, both from our residents and our faculty um, right. Over the last 20 years, I think is a is a major accomplishment. Um, it's an it's supported by the Jackson Health System. It's supported by right. county tax dollars um, right. and federal right. government in terms of supporting the resident salaries. And um, it really provides very comprehensive care to people that, um, in many instances, would not um, uh, have access to that care. So I, I'm very proud of that. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. That's amazing. Wow. Um, well, it is one thing to have, you know, a, a career that has, has been impacting in, in your one little realm, but um, clearly it's just a testimony to your character um, as well as your expertise that you have done so many great things in the community as well. So we're grateful for that and thank, thank you. you. Um, very grateful for your time tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, if there aren't any more questions, if you've got one, you've got a, another little second to throw it up there. But um, I'm going to ask if the ladies would go ahead and put up the information about the locations of an urgent care center, um, the Jackson Urgent Care Center, so that you specifically can look and say, okay, which one is closest to me? And I would say, go ahead, grab your phone and enter that number in, save it in your phone, um, or look it up you know, on the website later and save that number so that, as Dr. Schwartz said, if you start feeling symptoms of something and you think you should go, you can call, check that wait time before, um, and to be able to make the decision if, if you need to head to ER or urgent care. So I know Tiffany's gonna pull up that screen here in just a second. Um, but Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks for- My pleasure. Yes, for educating us about urgent care and ER, but then you know, going off the subject a few times too is super helpful for us. And so we're very grateful, very, very thankful. All right, I think we're going to get that information here in just one second. It's coming up. I can feel it. I feel it. Here it comes. There you go. No, no. I, I saw it in one of the in one of the slides. One slides. Okay, it's coming. Great to know you said five different locations throughout Miami, correct? That's correct. Uh, That's great. Keystone, uh, Nor North Dade, Country Walk. Um, oh, awesome. Doral. Um, so we're great, great. And I just want to mention, um, ladies and gentlemen that are watching, if you have missed any of the previous summer to school webinars, um, those are accessible on jacksonevents.org. And then go ahead and save the date. We're going to be back again. We've been doing these bi weekly. So you're off next week. Catch up next week on one that you missed. And then join us again Thursday, August 9th, same time, 8 p.m. And we're going to be talking about sports. Uh, you know, a lot of sports are starting up again. And you're kind of like, oh, how do we do this in social distancing, injury prevention? We're going to be addressing all of that with another medical professional. So make plans to join us on August 9th at 8 p.m. for that one. We're excited. Awesome. Well, it looks like we might be having a little trouble getting those up there. Um, but if anyone has, those, has questions, you can drop those there and we will um, we'll address those with Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz, how many grandchildren do you have? Tell us about your grandchildren. I have four granddaughters, uh, age range from 15 to four. Oh. And uh, my grandson is uh, 12. Oh, that's so great. So great, so great. Yeah, they grow up very quickly. Awesome. But never never having had granddaughters, it's certainly uh, my my two older sons um, uh, have uh, grand have daughters and so uh, right. they have a very different experience. Although my my middle son um, was out driving with the two little girls in the back seat in their car seats. And he called me up and he said, you know, he said, I was driving and I turned around and answered uh, Cece, his, his youngest daughter, and I answered her and I thought to myself, wow, that sounds just like what my father told me. <laughs> so, it, um, <laughs> When we become parents, we realize that mom and dad start coming out of our mouth and we think, wait right. a minute. <laughs> it's actually, it's okay. actually been a, a funny for me um, to see that my sons, uh, who are now parents, um, are mimicking, complained a lot about their own upbringing, but but are now mimicking behavior that uh, that they learn. So it all comes back, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess the apples don't really fall far from the tree. That's right. That's right. Well, I know just as a mom, children are a blessing, but I know children, grandchildren, must be just the total crown of blessing. So I love that, um, and I've got to think that your kids and your your grandchildren, probably your children, but you got to be their urgent care center. I'm sure they're calling you up saying, okay, hey, tell us what's going on. <laughs> Especially my younger son. He usually calls me at least three or four times a month. Oh my uh, goodness. That's great. That's great. Awesome. But awesome. He also admits, he said, it's your son, the hypochondriac calling. <laughs> 
I love it. I love it. He's not having to worry about any hospital bills or co-pays. He's like, I'm going to call dad and see what he says. That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have any further questions, um, we are going to wrap it up here. I'm so sorry. We don't have that final screen to show you. Maybe the ladies can throw it up here in just one second, but again, you can Google, um, jacksonhealth.org and you will find all of those urgent care centers there as well. And remember the children's ER as well as the adults ER are open 24 seven. So of course, I think you said urgent care is eight to eight, 365 days a year, all the holidays. So if your primary doctor is closed or if you don't have a primary doctor, you've got an urgent care every day of the year. Um, and if you have a serious emergency, of course you have an ER always at your disposal. So 24 hours a day is great, but um, wonderful. Well, if no other questions, we'll, um, we'll hand it off, but thank you so much again, Dr. Schwartz. You're Grateful welcome. To have thank you. you. Very nice to meet you. Awesome. You as well. Thanks ladies and gentlemen. We hope to see you August 9th at 8 p.m.